Mark uh, Heckler from yes. uh, uh, VMware now, and yeah. it's here with us. Of course, everybody knows Mark, the spring yeah. expert from VMware, used to be Pivotal. <laughs> but yeah, so very nice, and today we'll be talking about spring, about reactive, or anything about spring, any wisdom you can shed on this topic. Oh, yeah. this is going to so, be a short conversation then. Yeah. I, oh, I, no, I don't have yeah, much. No. <laughs> but I'm you happy do. to be here. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. So, yeah, so for me, I've been doing like reactive uh, programming, reactive systems systems, reactive streams, um, efficacy. So a lot of people ask a lot of questions, but first of all too, like what is your impression currently, right? The state of say reactive streams, reactive programming, reactive systems. Can you shed some light on that for us? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting space, right? Because uh, we're always asked to do more with less yeah. and it's hard to do that with the same tool set you've traditionally been using. And uh, reactive programming and the reactive streams um, Reactive Streams implementations, various yeah. implementations, offer a way to do just that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, nothing's for free, obviously. You know, you do have a, a little bit different approach to the way you, you do things, yeah. but it certainly gives you a, a higher potential for utilization. There are cases where you can boost performance. There are other cases you might lose a just a, a hint of performance, but it depends on your circumstances. And in the cases where you uh, don't need it, it doesn't hurt you to, to speak of, but in the case where you do need it, it dramatically helps you in terms of your scalability. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's um, it's a really good space. I mean, it, yep. it seems like there are people kind of discovering this topic every day still, yes. yeah. uh, but it's something that's been under active development for a number of years and yep. is, is getting to that, or has gotten to that stage, I should probably should say, that's right. to where it's mature and stable and performant. And uh, it's, yeah. uh, again, it's a great time to get involved with, with uh, with reactive streams and reactive programming in general. Yeah, sure. So, but then can you tell us, maybe from your experience, like, what is it that's stopping people from like, you know, aggressively adopting it? I mean, it's great. Everybody comes and listen, but they go home. They're not actually ready to use it yet. I've, it's been intriguing me, like why? What would be the reason? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, as with most new approaches to things, most yeah. tools, most tool chains, uh, that are different, it takes some some changing. Yes. And of course, as much as we all embrace change, we all are reluctant about it at times. That's right. But I do think, and I'll, I, I can speak more to the spring side of things, so I, I don't want to like, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I know, so I'll, <laughs> I'll cover that, uh, that's what I know best. But um, you, I think many times when we create a new tool set or a new approach to doing things, we don't make it necessarily that easy to transition into that from what we're doing. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have bridge technologies or an approach that is very uh, low friction to move from one to the other. And in spring, the way we approached it is yeah. to make it as frictionless as possible to switch from an imperative model to a reactive model. And by that, what I mean is that uh, everybody is free to implement the reactive stream specification in yeah. the way they see fit, and they can determine their level of compatibility and compliance yeah. with the TCK, the Technology Compatibility Kit. And that's great that's right. because there are yeah. different visions that can be uh, used to implement that. That's right. uh, the way we did it is we based kind of everything around like Java 8, Streams API, Lambdas, and um, we, we kind of looked at Spring as the foundation. So uh, if you are a Java developer or a Spring developer, you're used to, let's say when you return a value from a, a method, I started yeah. to say function, I'm getting yeah. caught yeah. one already again. <laughs> but if you return a value yeah. from a function slash, me slash method, uh, it can be a, let's say an object of type T. So yeah. a, a thing, one thing, yeah. or a, a an iterable of type T. So a collection right. of objects, let's say. That's right. uh, with, with our implementation, Project Reactor, what we did is we said, look, it, it makes sense to have a reactive publisher, which can be zero to N. Yeah. But to specialize that and to consider things as a mono mm -hmm. in our parlance, that's right. so one zero or one value, one which thing. corresponds to that one object of type T, that's right, uh, or a flux, which can be zero to n, which yeah. means like a small collection or even an indeterminate number over an indefinite amount of time. Yeah. Uh, so right. I, I think uh, when you switch from the imperative to reactive model within Spring applications, yep. you're switching from one thing to one another very similar thing, which helps reduce those barriers to entry. Oh, uh, the other mm -hmm. thing I think that makes a lot of sense, I sorry, I don't mean to go so long no, on an answer please. on one question, but, but the other thing that makes a lot of sense is that, um, uh, sorry, just lost my, no, uh, I hope worry. we can edit this out. <laughs> don't uh, worry. But, um, uh, but, but instead of having two different approaches to 
consuming, let's say, the values coming back from yeah. a publisher. Yeah. Uh, like we had REST template, which was used That's widely right. yeah. uh, for imperative um, interactions. Yeah. And we have web client. So yeah. right. web client is reactive, but it can also interact with um, imperative HTTP-based endpoints that will return non-publishers, so non-publisher types. Oh, okay. uh, so okay. it allows you to start transitioning without eating the entire elephant at once. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's in, it, absolutely critical because, I mean, as much as we might like to just shut off everything and rebuild everything overnight and boom, everything's reactive tomorrow, yeah. we can't. I mean, that's yeah. not the practical reality. So right. in, in so many ways, we've tried to make it easy for developers and, and to make it painless for developers to work with both worlds until such time as, it, as they can or it makes sense yep. to convert more or all or whatever works in their particular situation. Oh, I so see. So that's, yeah, yeah. that's my like, yeah. long answer to the short question is why that's isn't right. there more adoption? I think because um, in technology, sometimes we're not always great about easing the path, smoothing yes, the path. That's right. And um, yeah. yeah, that's one thing we're, tr or several things we're trying to do to make that path easier. Right, so. Yeah, okay. So now as such, I know that uh, looks like the spring the uh, API for the, the reactor, is it this pretty much the same, right, as RX Java 2, right? Uh, is that correct? Or it's that's similar, what I heard. Yeah, yeah there's similar. a lot of uh, yeah. cross pollination, which yeah. I, I think speaks well for like technology in 2020, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I, I always, you know, I have some longevity in the industry, and, and yeah. um, I go back five, 10 years to think of how we didn't always. Uh, cooperate well with, yeah. with with folks who we saw as quote our enemies or even frenemies, right? Yeah. Uh, so if they were developing in uh, JavaScript or yeah. sorry, I try not to. Laugh. Yeah, but yeah, I know. No, it, but I mean, it, it, I mean, we used to kind of look at things like when somebody'd say, "Well, why don't you do it this way?" Well, that's not the way we do things here. We have a different approach, and we yeah. we would spend hours justifying why we're not adopting something that may improve our tool chain. Yeah. And I think anymore we're getting much much better. And I, I say we, not just the Java community, but technologists yeah. as a whole. Yeah. So developers in JavaScript or yeah. or Kotlin or Java or or anything else. Uh, we're better at looking at other things that other communities are doing and saying, yeah. wow, we could do that. We may implement it differently, That's but right. that makes a lot of sense. So we're cross-pollinating better. Yeah, yeah. So, that, yeah, that makes I, sense. The RX Java, we, we get along with the, the folks there, uh, yeah. the Aqua Streams folks, the Vertex folks, we all talk. We yeah. don't always adopt everything everybody else does, but we cooperate, right? Yeah, and that's, that's right. where we are that's now. It. So I think that's a yeah. very good, good thing. So. That's right. Yeah. So that's what I think is the reactive streams. Is now we yes. kind of define like what the standards everybody should follow, but you can implement your own way. Yes. But the interface is the same. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the yep. For basic uh, interfaces. Yeah, so. and it's important for that to be verifiable because if we produce something and we test it, we go, oh, we fell short here. That's right. We know what to fix. Yeah. We know right. where the problem is. So there's yeah. there's no longer this contesting between like, well, your stuff doesn't work that way. No, no, yeah. sure it does. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's verifiable, mm -hmm. which saves a That's lot of right. time and potential you know, frustration. And everybody can can verify and validate where they're on that, that kind of like scale That's where right. they can say, okay, here are the things we're compatible with. Here are the things that are scheduled for the next version or whatever mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to where we can all get down to the business of making stuff work together. That's right. Because yeah. as a developer and, and right. you've worked in industry, I've worked yeah. in industry, most of us have yeah. uh, and, and are, That's right. we are always responsible as much as we might like to just standardize on one thing, but there's yeah. always this thing we have to integrate. Whether yeah. it's a stray system or a exactly. customer system or That's whatever. Right. Yeah. And, and and the more, uh, the more verifiable and compliant things are, the easier it is. Exactly, exactly. That's very cool. So yeah, so um, uh, some questions too that I sure. kind of get to from like different audience. They like to ask like things, for example, they said, actually it's a, a bit interesting too. They said, does every subscriber, you subscribe to some events, but what if in the middle of processing some events they unsubscribe, would that have any effect on that? For example, do you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, it depends on it depends on the publisher. If you have a hot publisher, that yeah. publisher keeps producing values. Yeah. Uh, if you have a cold publisher, then the, if you unsubscribe, then everything stops, right? Yeah. Um, that's right. And and I you typically think of things as always being a cold publisher, even though there are certain exceptions. Yeah. That, but you you kind of apply that general rule. But yeah. no, I mean, in, in in the context of a cold publisher, nothing really changes because no. you've just stopped listening. Nothing. So uh, the yeah. publisher stops publishing, which yeah. in in terms of that um, yeah. that increased utilization makes a lot of sense because yeah. if no one's listening, why would that 
that continue to churn away and process. Yeah, that it's just wasting cycles. So, yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. yeah. That's right. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Maybe like um, it's just and some other question because I also kind of intrigued me. For example, they said can CQRS pattern right can be like implemented using reactive programming something like that or, or do you handle deal with CQRS? Um, you're, you're primarily dealing with, yep. with events uh, and, and separating separation yep. of concerns. That's right. So whether you're dealing with an imperative model and you're 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 blocking or whether you're not, yep. uh, the same principles really apply. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, you'll true. you'll perhaps have some differences, or definitely have some differences in how you um, make sure everything happens that you're expecting to happen. But yep. no, I mean the, the principle yep. is the same. You're still you're still segmenting out Generally. functionality depending on true. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's just some question I recently have been asked. I'm saying, oh, an expert here. Let me ask. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah, not an so, expert. I always yeah. consider myself a constant learner because yeah, yeah. I, I always. Yeah. And this is a wonderful and terrible thing about our field, right? Yeah. So if you learn something every day, and I think we all should strive to because the technology, I mean, there's true. there's new stuff coming out every day, just That's tools. Right. That's right. And then language constructs and, and yeah. environments and all the stuff that we could possibly learn new That's every right. day. Yeah. And yet, even if we learn something or some things every day, we're still losing ground. You, right. You, so, yeah. so that can be really frustrating or exhilarating. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so I always consider myself just kind of the bottom of the pole, the oh, perpetual yeah. learner, <laughs> because as much as I learn and I'm always striving to learn, I'm losing ground. Oh yeah. yeah. But it's a good challenge that means that we're never going to be bored. True, true. <laughs> that part is true, and that's so, what also drives me to right, want to stay right. in this field yeah, because absolutely. it's just the excitement. It's always something new. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You discover new ways of doing things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah another question. Now that you're here, right? There's yes. um, database. So with database uh, connectivity, right now, um, okay. So database engine, they don't have like traditional relational database. Still don't have like non-blocking I/O. So yes. yeah. So in, in other words, in in a in a true sense, like there, there's no true reactive systems because if you're a whole stack and then it gets down to, okay, even though you have connectivity, it's a reactive library, but you get down to the database level when it's processing, it's still doing non-blocking. Then do you, do you think then, how would then react, doing reactive be enhancing an application in that sense? Do you, uh, oh. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, uh, you know, I, I think everybody was kind of hoping uh, for a ADBC. Yeah, that's um, right. But yeah. uh, R2DBC is something that, that Pivotal kind of spearheaded, but certainly yeah. we weren't the only contributors. There were a lot of folks who got really excited about the concept of, yeah. of reactive relational database connectivity. And that's right. the, the NoSQL databases already, like early on, adopted yeah, and provided a, a reactive yeah. drivers. That's right. And yeah. then R2DBC kind of stepped in to fill in that gap because initially, when you say, "Well, look, it supports Mongo and Couchbase and Cassandra and Redis," they're like, "Yeah, but what about Oracle or what yeah. about MySQL or That's right. Postgres or, yeah. or Microsoft SQL Server or whatever?" That's right. Yeah. And and you 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 realize really quickly that if you are non-blocking until you get to the database, but you block, yeah. you're probably not leveraging as much you're not you're not scaling to the point you could that's right so um r2dbc was born out of that as mm -hmm. well as obviously the, the uh, before those before that the um the oh, reactive yes, drivers the but that mm -hmm. said the reason that makes a huge difference um uh, is that if you're if you're talking about a publisher at the database level uh, -huh. uh then I mean, let's say, let's go back imperative, because yeah. I, I, I always go back to simple examples and build out. Yeah. Uh, but if you have an imperative request that w should return a million records, uh -huh. what have we traditionally done? We've, sh we've slipped or shifted to, to paging, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll mm -hmm. say, uh, crud, that's a million records. Uh, right. Well, we'll request the first 10 or the first 100 or whatever it is. Yeah. So it gets to be rather cumbersome because you keep having to make those calls. If you have a publisher, and you're saying, look, give me 10, give me 100. Mm -hmm. What that, what's happening is that processing, that that intelligence, if you will, is shifted to that publisher, to that driver. Oh, so it's saying, okay. look, you're you're telling me you can request 10. You're only wanting 10. I'll only give you 10. Yeah. So it's not even, it it's it's far more efficient, I guess. That's I should true. Say. Yeah. So so I think the yeah. RTDBC, the reactive drivers for the various different NoSQL databases, right. are filling a huge void that really until recently we didn't realize yes. we had yeah. or weren't really sure how to approach or That's solve right. the best way. But I think yeah. we're, 
I think we're there. I yeah, really do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, very cool. Wow, yeah, so I guess we covered quite a lot of things and thank you so much, Mark, and I, we can go on and on there. Yes, and I yes. love talking with you. It's Likewise. just a great teacher. It's just so inspiring. Likewise, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we I will have you it. back and we'll have more questions next time. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs>